This is Trisha Carter and Jackie Markham on the 5th of October 2023. Um, we're here with George Mills to interview him for the Kingsland Oral History Project. George, thank you for seeing us both. Um, perhaps we can start with where you were born and brought up and some memories from your early life. Yes, um, I was born at the Rodhurst, uh, Prestine, Radnorshire. <laughs> Um, my father was a wagoner at the farm where he worked for 40 years, um, 20 for the Price family and then the next 20 years for Lord Reynolds. Um, so horses have always been part of my life. Um, so from an early age horses have always been part of my life. Um, my uh, uh, mother uh, was uh, born in Dollier in uh, Radnorshire and my father was a ganger on, on the railway. Um, he died in 1926 um, with uh, pernicious anemia, something that could have been cured now. Um, and um, uh, I had um, was four uncles, uh, two were railway men, one was a guard on the railway and the other was a driver who drove the King George V steam engine. And there were three Welsh boys who worked on the railway down South Wales who drove the King George V. And he used to go from Paddington, from um, um, Bristol Temple Meads to Paddington, 110 miles in 105 minutes with four stops. And um, then my other uncle was in the Bristol Police. Um, my mother was a cook at Keaton Hospital when she married my father, who was working above the quarries at Dollier at a farm called Wazel. And he came down to the rod and got the wagoner's job. And he took the place of a fellow called Joe Brick who got killed by lightning going into the stables in, at the Rod Farm. And him and the, the first horse he was leading were killed. And a chap called Jimmy Jones, with a horse coming behind, um, had his uh, moustache and something singed, and the horse, I think, was singed up. And But they, they, they survived the, the lightning, you know. And Mrs. Brick, at that time, had seven children under 11. Unbelievable, isn't it? Yeah. Right. So anyway, that was it. That's where I was born. Um, uh, nobody will ever have the life I had again. Um, our playground was thousands of acres. We could go anywhere about there. The farm was about over 300 acres. There was woods and everything and adjoining farms. We could go anywhere. Unbelievable, you know. I'd got an older brother, seven years older and a sister who was four years older. And um, uh, I went to uh, school at Titley to begin with, and then um, at Lady Hawkins School in Kington. I didn't do very well at school. Um, I passed the 11 plus, but there was too much that I couldn't take in all at the same time. I couldn't do, <coughs> try to learn <coughs> Uh, Shakespeare passages, or um, do algebra, geometry, and all those sort of things. I couldn't take all those things in at the same time, you know. So I, I wasn't very good at school, but anyway. And my first job ended in more or less disaster. Didn't, it didn't end well, it pressed in anyway. But then um, there was a chap Job was. Who was um, uh, he was in with the blacksmith in Prestine, but uh, we 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 didn't get on. He got two two sons and the father, and um, uh, I didn't gel with them at all. But anyway, uh, there was a chap called Harry Williams who was the rural industries organizer uh, for the three counties, a lovely chap who lived in Hereford, and uh, anyway he got me fixed up with Ali and Albert Davis 
and um, they drove up on a Sunday to the Oxford at Preston, a Sunday afternoon, to the Oxford pub at Preston, and he interviewed me underneath in the yard at the, at the Oxford for the job, and said, come down to Kingston and have a look round at the forge, which I did in a couple of days' time. And I started on the 31st of March, 1952, to serve my apprenticeship. Now, I was indentured to Albert, uh, who kept the pub, in uh, the Angel Pub in, in Kingsland. Uh, but, of course, he, he, his health, uh, uh, did, um, you know, went down and uh, Ali took it on. Um, always known by Ali, but he was Albert as well, you know. Um, and there, his uncle was Fred. Well, working for them was a pleasure. <laughs> I couldn't have been with better people. Um, they were top class, top class tradesmen. I never got anywhere near the standard that they were. In all my years that I was black and Indian, I never got anywhere near their standard. They was that much higher than me. I said in later years, well, they started when they were born. I was more or less 18 when I started, so they had 18 years start on me anyway. But they, they, do you know what? They were wonderful. Um, I kept the pub. At lunchtime, they'd take me up to the Angel. Um, Albert w was working there then in his harbour. Um, he'd go straight into the bar after he'd washed his hands. All he'd have, he, he learnt me a wonderful lesson, really. Although he kept the pub, he never got on the drink. All he had was a small glass of lemonade and uh, cider. And he'd have a drink of that before his lunch. They'd have their lunch. <coughs> Ali or his sister Jean or his other sister Edie would bring me a cup of tea in the bar. And I'd talk to the, the locals who were all, always in there. Some of them were in there regular. <coughs> One chap was always in there, was a fellow called Jack Wood. Um, he was the baker for Ali's brothers who had the shop in the village. And after he'd done the baking, the first thing he did was come to the pub. And he, he was there, he had liquid lunch every day he did. <laughs> and after Ali had, um, uh, had his lunch, he'd come and they'd play coits. And um, they, they were experts, the both of them. Expert coit players, real tough notchers, you know. Unbelievable. So we'd have a few hours there, and some of those workers who worked at uh, Ben Grizz or Longmore would come down there drinking cider at lunchtime and that, and uh, then we'd go back to work. But I couldn't have been with better people. The whole family, um, like Ali, his father, his mother, and his two sisters, Jean and Edie, who lived next door to the... Jean was married, of course, to... To Jock Scott, the electrician. Um, Edie was married to um, uh, Herbie Jones, who was the head sawyer at Kingston Sawmills. And they lived in a little cottage right adjacent to the Angel Pub, right underneath the archway. And um, they all treated me uh, uh, very well. And I was even at, um, at Jean's wedding. And um, she came to my after party. Years later, uh, with with Jock and, and Fred, Uncle Fred. Hi. Yeah, w w wonderful, wonderful memories of people. They were all very good to me. And like I say, life, life was a pleasure to, to work with them, you know. Um, Ali then got married. At that time, um, the uh, telephone exchange in Kingsland was manual. And so if somebody rang in the middle of the night, he had to get up and plug them in, you know. And it covered a wide area. They went right up above Shobden, uh, the Kingston area did, so he, he was quite busy, you know. So he uh, was spending less and less time at the forge. And anyway, he said, well, I think it'd be best if you went on to somewhere else. And so um, I was fixed up and I went to Bromyard to work for a year. Um, Cyril and Sons was the name of the firm. Ewart Newbold was the boss. It was his uh, father-in-law who'd been the owner of the of the uh, the forge. 
But he 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 so he was the office man. He, that's all he did was office work, and it was blacksmiths and wheelwrights and undertakers all in all in one, you know. So I had a year or so there. Um, finished my training at the Technical College at Hereford at the time, and then Ali came back for me and said, would I come back and work for him again? And so I went back, and then he said, uh, and then you can have a go take it down yourself. So I, I, I worked for uh, 12 months or so with him again, and then uh, he I took uh, rented the, the forge off him and, and went on my own, and Fred, his uncle, came and worked for me and until he retired. Wonderful, wasn't it? Wonderful, yeah, yeah. yeah. Uh, so Ali came to uh, Bromyard and, and got me back there. Um, and I worked for him for about a year. And then I took over. And my brother, who'd been in the agricultural sort of business, came and worked with me. <coughs> and uh, Fred Davis worked for us. Um, and uh, so we went on for a, a few years like that. And uh, we were shoeing horses. Regularly, my brother didn't shoe, but um, uh, he'd done the welding jobs and things like that. Um, at different times, uh, I went to Bromyard uh, and helped him out there. Um, they had a, their blacksmiths left, and so I would have a, a few days there with them. And I worked him um, out as far as Colwall and all, all over those places, very near to Worcester. And um, uh, in in one fortnight, in those days, I worked in five different counties in a fortnight. <laughs> and um, I was regularly working in in Radnorshire, at Pressine and Knighton and places like that. Um, I worked for a, a Mr. Woolley who did the tar spraying on the roads, who lived at uh, Bucknell. And then later on at um, Hopton Castle, so that was in Shropshire, um, Bromyard, all out over, uh, like I say, part of Worcestershire, Colwall and there, that area. Um, was another one, Radnorshire, Herefordshire, and I went up to uh, Kumo Inn on the Epint, between Biltwells and Brecon, to a pub called the Griffin Inn where actually I met my wife, but she was from Keaton. And just by accident that we met, and um, I got engaged there actually, outside the pub there on my way to a, a horse uh, uh, show at a place called Pont Van. But anyway, <coughs> um, got to know the people at the pubs who were going to the pony sales. And that's how I got to know my wife, because she was her brother-in-law, uh, he came came up there to the sales. He was the RSBCA inspector in Kington. And um, anyway, um, they uh, at the pub there, they had the, one of the oldest Welsh mountain pony studs about. They were right in the first uh, edition of the uh, Welsh, um, the, um, um, what's the name book, you know? Uh, the Kumo Winstad, and but they'd got uh, donkeys. They'd got a, a Jack and a Jenny and and a and a foal. And um, I went up there and trimmed their feet. And they took them down to the studios in Penarth to record a program that was on Welsh television at the time, a religious program on a Sunday night called Land of Song. So that they made it, they made it five different um, places in a in a fortnight, you know. Yeah. Ah, wonderful! I went shooing all shooing all over the place, <coughs> and it um, actually. Um, I got injured. Injured my back, with a horse. It's chopped in court. Um, trimming the feet of a. a a young one there, um, that belonged to um, a, 
uh, Walker. Her father was Peter Walker, the racing driver. Her father was Peter Walker, the racing driver. That's who this pony belonged to. And Mrs. Um, uh, Mrs. Walker later married Colonel Colbert. But that's where I got injured my back there. And so I was looking for more or less another job. Um, my children were small. They were going to Wivington School. Um, they said, the little ones can come, but the parents will have to come with them because we can't look after them all. So I went and I was looking for places underneath the marquees, under, right tight against the marquee, where the grass was green and, and uh, clean, that I could lie down. And I'd lie down for a few minutes and then I'd get up, but I couldn't walk, I couldn't sit down, I couldn't lie down, I couldn't do anything. With my back. How long was this for? Hmm? How long was your back? Oh, for, well, you suffered all my life, haven't they? But anyway, <laughs> um, how about that time? Um, Ali Davis said, uh, he was got the Kingston Post Office. He said, I'm going up to Keenton. He said, it would suit you, he said, to do the post round round the village. You come over here every day, anyway. If you came a bit earlier, you could change it to forge <coughs> and then carry on with your blacksmithing after. And so I did, and when I started, I couldn't stand up to sort the letters. I couldn't sit down to, to sort them. My, my back was in that bad state. <coughs> And if the doctor, I had to go and see, a, have a medical, but if he'd have ever asked me to touch my toes, that would have been it. He would have never have asked me, you know. <laughs> <coughs> anyway, I had the job. To get on that bike to go around the village to begin with, it killed me. The, f the first part every morning would kill me. But anyway, we did it. Did it for a few years. Then I did the... Uh, relief for them and did they learnt me the um, the croft round it up round croft castle i started um at the top of kings and up on shirleith and and down to the brook and back out on the lady court road and then back out on to tinacoy de chobden back down to um uh, just mortimer's cross then up over the um over the top uh, up on to Lye. And I came out, my last call was the mill at or just below it, um, it uh, Ames Street. And then I started again at the mill at Mortimer's Cross and went round Lacton and Croft Castle and down the lane and Bicton and all out that area and Aston. And I finished more or less at, um, at uh, the Lag Bridge sort of thing. And they learnt me that round, so I did that while they, uh, when they had holidays. So I worked for the post office. There was um, uh, three postmen, full-time. Um, they did uh, Shobden, uh, Amestry, and uh, this round that I was on, um, which we'll say was Croft Castle. And they learnt me the Croft one. So I, always, I stayed on that one all the time. And they, they changed when they were on it. So I worked for so many months, a year for them. And then Ali said he was going to Kington. And um, I, I got that wrong a bit. Um, when he went to Kington, he said, there's a job going at Kington on the post if you want it. If you'd like to apply for it. So I went to Hereford for an interview and got the job. And I knew a couple of the postmen anyway at Kington, you know. And so then I worked there for uh, 24 years and, until I retired. But I went to work every morning with my left shoe undone. Why? I, could, I couldn't get down there to do him up with my back. I could get my sock on by put, doing this sort of thing. And I could do, go this way and, and do my shoe up, but I couldn't go that way. My back would kill me. 
I, after lace him up later in the morning, after I'd got going, after I'd been in and out the van a few times, and I, I'd slacken up and I'd do it, you know. Can I ask, George, weren't the letters sorted in King's Land in those days? Yes, it was all sorted, oh, yes. In I, the back, yes. And yeah. when we came to, when I came to Kington as well, look, it, it was all sorted. We had to sort it all. Sacks and sacks came from Hereford every morning. Mm -hmm. We got to sort it all out before starting. Yes. George, I wonder if you could tell me a little bit more about who you, who your customers were in the blacksmith shop. <coughs> well, it worked for a terrific range of um, uh, uh, of people, you know, over a, over a wide area. <coughs> <coughs> uh, when I went to Kingston first, um, uh, we went. Uh, Ali had got a, a big Rover car, um, he'd load the forge up in the back and we'd go down to Elms of Wharton below Lempster and they'd got sh uh, Blackshire horses at that time and we'd have a day shoeing for them. They'd also got the ponies that did the milk rounds around uh, Lempster so we shot the milk ponies and they got a couple of hunters as well. <coughs> That we did, and uh, I can remember they got a, like a this dairy herd <coughs> um, with the cows, and they got a cow with wanted its feet trimmed, and so they got us to to do it. <coughs> so Ali got the big cutters, the uh, herdsman got one side the cow with a, a length of um, a pipe in, um, galvanized pipe in. <coughs> which we put over top of his one hawk and, uh, hawk and underneath the other <coughs> and we were holding him up and he started kicking and the cutters got off the end of the, his hoof and he flew by the side of uh, Mr. Elm Senior's ear who was stood at the back and he missed him by a fraction of an inch and it fetched the pastor off the wall. <coughs> if it had hit him, he'd have killed him. But we were silly, ever attempting to try and do it that way. We should have had ropes or something on that that cow uh, to, to stop him kicking like that, you know. We were amateurs, <coughs> amateurs. So we had days shooting down there. We worked all over the place. We was working in forestry commissions, doing forestry horses, all up on Radnor Forest I used to go, with the horses that were, were getting the timber out in those days, you know. Yeah and uh, ponies, uh, uh, point to pointers, hunters and that. <coughs> when I was serving my apprenticeship, we'd done a horse called Danny Boy, belonging to Huey Price of Nogs Court, Ivington. And he won six Saturdays running in the point to points when I was serving my apprenticeship in about 1953 or four. A wonderful horse. And he was an odd one. His one eye was farther back in his head than the other. He was a little bit lopsided. Great horse, great horse. Wonderful. But Huey never ever rode him. He he couldn't. He threw him off years, years when he got him when he was a young one. He gave £120 for him, I think. That was the money. Money, a lot of money, you know, over the years. But um, uh, he, he never, never rode him. He always led him by the side. And he'd bring him to the blacksmith shop like that. He'd ride a horse called Gay Boy, who he'd rode in point to points earlier, <coughs> and lead Danny Boy. And Danny Boy would get off him, and he'd go on off up the road, and he'd catch up with him later on. <laughs> well, he was a, 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 a real character, he was. <coughs> and then, of course, after that, I uh, used to work for his uh, brother of Hughes, Tom Price of Eaton, who had the mare called Red Dove. Um, he bought the mother before she was about to go for slaughter I believe uh, when he bought her only about 30 pound I think he gave for the mother <coughs> and he bred this horse called uh, Red Dove out of the premium stallion called All Red and uh, Tom trained her himself um, and she won 16 hurdle races 
and she won the well I shot her to win the Welsh champion hurdle. And after she retired at eleven years old, she had six filly foals. Six filly foals, six six girls, six daughters, and they all won races. <coughs> I think they got up to about fifty all between them. And um up in that ceiling there, you can see a mark of a, a champagne cork there somewhere. <laughs> that Gordon Price took the lid off the champagne and it hit the ceiling. He he brought it up here after, um, I think it was um, Nimble Dove, won a big flat race at, uh, at uh, Warwick or somewhere. And um, the little jockey, what was his name? Willie Carson. Willie Carson rode her, and Gordon brought me, and he brought this bottle of champagne to celebrate. That was a flat race, but most of the others were hurdle races. <coughs> and um, I took part in a, they did a program about Gordon, uh, Gordon Price's Legacy. And it was on TV. And uh, I was filmed, put in the racing plates on a daughter of Red Dove, which was Grey Dove, to go to Ludlow Races. Yeah. Hey. Yeah. Hey. yeah. 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 Um, ah. Not such glamorous horses. What about Billy Mitten? And oh, Billy. Oh, no. Yeah, Billy Mitten. Um, now he had a he hauled coal from the station, uh, and that he'd been in the hauling business for all his life. And I think he was the first man in Kingston who had a lorry, even before the Bengris. But he gave it up at the beginning of the war um, to uh, because he couldn't get petrol and went back to the horse, you know. And um, uh, Billy uh, would have been a, a prisoner of the Germans in the First World War. <coughs> and uh, the Bengri boys, Bob and, and Harold, who were going in the, got the coal merchant's business, the same family who's in Kingsley now, um, he told me that uh, Bill told him a little bit about it one morning. He said about how he um, uh, was taken prisoner early in the morning. He said, before he had his breakfast, he said he damn well didn't have any the next morning either. <laughs> but uh, And I think they knocked him about, they knocked his teeth out with a rifle butt and something, the Germans. But... He, he didn't get on with everybody. He didn't like being... He was his own man, sort of thing. I got on very well with him, but uh, he, he didn't hit it off with everybody. But the things he told me was unbelievable. And one of them was that um, he uh, used to take coal and coke from Kingsland Station to Shobden Court a hundred ton at an order. And he took that up, shoved in rock with a horse and cart. How, how often that happened, I, I wouldn't know. But a hundred ton in, a, in an order. Um, my connections to Kingsland, um, like I say, I couldn't have been with better people. Um, and I never got to the standard that, that, they, my, that they were, I tell you. No, they were they were very good, very good. Everybody very good to me. Can you tell but us um, um, the um, I got connections with Kings, and it I didn't know at the time. I didn't know until the nineteen seventies that my great uncle, who left school at twelve, uh, went to work at a, a dairy in. Uh, um, Uh, Monmouth and he came back after a couple of years and he walked from Holmes March in Lyons Hall to the Bella Byton to be interviewed uh, for a job at uh, in the stables at uh, Street Court in Kingsland I can't tell you the owner I, I can't remember who the owner was at the time but he walked over there to meet him at a meet of the hunt. And the owner thought it was easier for him to walk to Kingsland, uh, walk to 
to Biden and what it was for him to get to Kingsland to be interviewed. So he had a couple of years at Kingsland, at the Sables, and he saved a bob or two, which he had to pay to start his apprenticeship at Lewis's the Carpenters and Wheelwrights in Kingsland. Um, he finished his apprenticeship um, when uh, he was 21, and I think he left there about uh, 1899, as far as I can work out. And he went to work on the uh, the wagon works at Crewe, making the, the railway carriages and that. Um, and after how long, I don't know, but uh, he got made redundant, and he got a job as an agent for the Pearl Insurance Company. And he finished up as area manager at Wolverhampton. And he'd left school when he was 12. And he came back here to, to Lions Hall, I, could, I don't know when, because the family wasn't in contact with him. Um, my uncle who was in the, one of my uncles who was in the Bristol Police, uh, was 16 at the time when my grandfather died. And this uh, great uncle of mine said something at his funeral and my uncle said, I've never forgiven him for, for what he said, but I never ever knew what he was. I never knew what he did say. But anyway, so we, they, we had no contact with him and until he came back here sometime and I got, got back in contact with him in uh, about 19, uh, 1965 or six around that time. And um, his first wife had died, look, and then he went back to where he uh, worked at Kingsland in the, uh, uh, the wheelwrights and that. Um, that wheelwrights, the uh, carpenters and, oh, and cart works. makers and all that. And um, uh, he, he married the daughter, Mary Lewis, when he, when he was in his late 80s. And he died when he was on holiday in Aberystwyth when he was 91. But he'd, he'd done his garden up until that year, you know. So he told me these things about it, and he told me that when he was at uh, at Kingston working, the local policeman used to tutor them boxing in the blacksmith shop at Cobb Nash. And he said, of course, there's th in the Pentis where we'd done the chewing, there were three sides, and the boys used to get up the other side to make the, the force to make the ring. And in the evenings, the, the policeman used to tutor them to do some boxing. They, whether they had boxing gloves, I don't know, because that was near enough bare knuckle days, you know. But um, that, that's what he told me. <coughs> now, Bill Mitten could tell me that uh, Lewis's exhibited their carts at the three county show at Worcester and, and at the Hereford three county show. They didn't go to Gloucester. But he said they used to leave Kingsland nine or ten o'clock on a Sunday night. One would have a load of shabs and wheels and others would have bodies and that sort of thing. And they walked through the night to the Worcester showground. Uh, Lewis's men, the workmen and that, would be there on the Monday morning to put them back together. And they, if they knocked any paint off, they'd touch it up. And those carts were sold to farmers in the Worcester area at the show. They never had to fetch them back. And Bill told me on one occasion, he said it, it rained every step of the way from Kingsland to Worcester. And they walked through it. Uh, oh, Bill, Bill Mitten was a very interesting chap. Um, another interesting thing he told me was that he'd hauled tons and tons of, of horse manure from Kingsland Station onto St Mary's Farm that came from the pit ponies down South Wales. And although some people would say that's got to be a lie, it wasn't, it was the truth. The fact being that uh, the ponies were, pit ponies were down underneath, uh, their drop-ins had to come out. They came out the same time as the coal, came out onto the railway, and it all came on the same train, and it came to Kingsland, 
and went on to St Mary's Farm because the pits were owned by Amlin Williams who owned the a lot of Kingston Village and St Mary's Farm. Yep. Now, <coughs> um, when I went to Kingston to begin with, like I say, Albert, uh, they kept the Angel Pub. Um, Ali Davis, one of the founder members of the Old Lactonian Rugby Club. And they walked out at their tra their um, headquarters, were in the, the Angel, and they'd got some uh, concrete block buildings where they washed. I don't think they had hot water at that time. And they were built by, I didn't know him, he died before I went to Kingsland, one of Ali's older brothers, George, who was in the building trade. And I think he built built them. And that's where they, they, uh, uh, their headquarters was. And they walked through the garden at um, Kingsland, out into the, onto the rugby field, which belonged to at that time was rented by Mr. Price, lovely, lovely man, Mr. Price in Kingsland, one of the last people to have horses, and his father and son were the wagoners, uh, Chamberlain, Charlie and Chamberlain, junior and senior, and Charlie uh, junior worked on the Herefordshire Council in 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 later years. <coughs> um. Yeah, the, I, the, the good the, the the rugby, and I can remember. Um, of course, at the Angel they kept a pig. Um, uh, Tom Mitchell uh, came and slaughtered the pig, and we carried him up the road to the shop in Kingsland, which was later the nursing home, where Ali's brothers kept the shop. Um, and uh, we took the pig down underneath. There was a big salting stone in a cellar underneath where you could put six pigs on, I would think. And we took the pig there, and then Tom Mitchell would have cut him up in the air two time. And that was the last time I saw him, of course. But anyway, that was it. That was one of the things. Um, I can go on from there. Oh, the um, there was a chap who worked. I, I, I wonder I've gone over my story now. You have to correct me if I'm wrong. But um, we went up to the Angel Inn at lunchtime. They took me up at lunchtime from the blacksmith shop when I started working there. And after Ali had, had had his lunch and that, he'd, either him or his sisters would bring me a cup of tea. And him and George. Um, uh, not George. Um, Wood. Jack Wood. He was the baker for their brothers at the shop, and he was there every lunchtime. And they they played coits and that, you know. And these uh, workers from Berg uh, Bergwind used to come down and and drink and that. And then after that, we went back to work again. But uh, no, wonderful. They were they were they were all very good to me. The um, uh, the Davis family, yeah, very good, wonderful. <coughs> um, one of the people we worked for, the Wenham and Elliots, um, were at the Brook Farm at Kingsland. They were two single ladies, and they were very successful with the Kerry Hill sheep. They won prizes for years and years at the Three County Show and all over the place. Um, I knew them a little bit at the time because they were into a horses a bit and did a little bit there for them. But in later years they moved to a farm that they owned um, on the top of Blackton. <coughs> and uh, they got into the uh, Welsh ponies, the Welsh mountain ponies, the Section A's. And uh, I kept them myself so um, we got a lot in common. So um, uh, and they, they, they got successful. After being successful with the with the sheep in earlier years, they got to the top in um, or pretty well in uh, with the, with the ponies, you know. Unbelievable, you know. Yeah.
another interesting character in Kingsland um, was a fellow called uh, George Griffiths. He worked as a mechanic for uh, Maurice Markham at the garage. Um, he, he was a very clever old, old boy. Um, he'd been in the army. Um, he scoured the uh, the tip at Shobden uh, for um, different things, parts of televisions and that. And he'd uh, t take them and he'd get other people's and televisions going with spares he got off there. And it went on until the council upgraded their uh, dust carts and they'd got to a sort of crusher thing on the back and then it all got crushed up and he, he couldn't get any spares and it crushed it up be, before he could get them. In the earlier years people would tip perhaps televisions out in the ashes and the paper and everything in the back it sort of cushioned it and they never got broke you know but um, that's what he did and he also um, built his house he had a black and white house and bit by bit, I think, when he could afford the bricks, he's done a, a sort of veneer around it in brick. And I, I don't think he ever took the out, the inside down. I think he ever said as it was. But he, 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 he did all that himself when he could afford a few bricks. He'd buy them and, and then do a bit more. And he'd done all that himself, you know. He was a, he was a, he was a clever chap, a nice bloke. And um, at that time, it was, you won't believe it now, but we used to, we used to bring uh, exhaust pipes for me to weld off cars. You can't believe that now, that we, you repair an exhaust pipe. But uh, that was one of the things that George would bring down for me. Me do a few jobs for, for um, Maurice Markham and that, different things. And also, there was a garage in Erdsland, and um, it was um, uh, Williams and Rimmer. Uh, Tommy Tommy Rimmer, I think the chap's name was, and they used to bring up their exhaust to me for for welding. You, you know, hi. Huh? We did we did all did all sorts of things, did all sorts of things, all sorts of, of repairs. <coughs> One of the earlier jobs I did at Kingsland, when I was served my apprenticeship, we made a lovely set of gates. It was on that George Lewis's premises in Kingsland for a, a Mr. and Mrs. Wazzle at the time <coughs> of wrought iron gates. I would think they'd cost three or four thousand pounds to make now. Lovely job. The other was I had a big part in the, doing the west doors of Lempster Priory Church. Um, a fellow called Philip Post in St. Alton uh, did the old oh, called done the woodwork, a top class chap. And <coughs> I had a lot to do uh, with making the studs. There were over a hundred studs in that in those doors. George, when you were working in Kingsland, can you remember much about other businesses that were around at the time? <coughs> um, yeah, well, of course, there was um, uh, Ben Grizzit Longmore. Um, they uh, had uh, steel lorries, but they also were, were agricultural um, contractors. Um, that was one firm. Kings and Sawmills was in a very big way at that time. There were only over 40 people working there, I think. Very big way, Kings and Sawmills. And I, the two girls who worked in the, in the offices uh, both married Germans. Um, one was um, uh, from uh, Charles Tree, uh, Frieda Jenkins, and the other was a lovely, lovely uh, girl, um, uh, Williams. Can I get her first name for a minute? Marge. Margie. Margie Williams. Margie Williams, lovely girl, married a German prisoner of war, and uh, they were together for the rest of their lives. A lovely chap, and I didn't get to know him until later in life. And he told me he was a prisoner of war at Prestine. He <coughs> had a truck that he went from Prestine to Kingsland 
worked contracting under contracting with with the Bengris, and then went back at night. <coughs> but just outside Prestine, uh, in a little small old in there, was a chap called Bill Mival, and he used to kill our pig. He was a butcher, um, and uh, he'd bring his truck back up from. He told me he could tell me. He'd bring the truck back up from Kingsland. Bill Mival would have his gate open going into his yard, would wave him in, he would park his truck there in the yard, he'd walk from there up to the camp in Prest in Prestine, the prisoner of war camp, he'd have a wash and change, he'd walk back down, he'd get the truck out then, and he'd go courting Margie at Prest <laughs> at Kingsland. And the thing about it is, if he took the truck in, he couldn't get him back out until the next morning, look. But they didn't know what hours he was working or anything like that, so he was able to get away with it. And he told me about that years later. That was a wonderful story, wasn't it? Yeah. But he knew all the farmers all up round about Prestine. He worked for all them as a contractor for for, for Benbridge, you know. They, they, were, they were in a big way at that time, you know. And like I say, Kings and Sawmills as well in a, in a big way. <coughs> um, who else was in business there? Oh, the goods were getting going then at, at Mortimer's Cross with with their timber part. Um, yeah. Um, and then, of course, Bengers got into the um, into the quarry and up at Lentil. They started on the road making and that sort of thing. Yeah. Lots of changes since that time. Pardon? A lot of change since that time. Unbelievable. Um, the changes in my life have been terrific. Um, I think I had a wonderful life. I had a wonderful life. And it's never going to happen to anybody else again. It's never going to happen again, you know? No. I've been very fortunate. <coughs> I think it was George Bernard Shaw or somebody said that the greatest assets a man can have is good health and a good wife. And I've been fortunate to have both. How lovely. George is I, been absolutely I had amazing. A, I had a wonderful wife from Europe just on 50 years. And my health until sort of two years ago was wonderful. And even with my stroke I had, I walked into Hereford Hospital and I walked back out at Newtown, Newtown which I'm very proud of. So I've never been carried in, <laughs> which I'm, I'm, I'm very proud of, you know. Yeah. 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 George, thank you for talking to us and sharing your memories. It's been absolutely lovely to hear everything. It's well, you know, there, there, there's things I've forgotten about, no doubt, but I, it'll come back to me. Oh, well, maybe we'll come back I, to you I, and we'll talk we'll again. Come back, yes. I'll get your telephone number. I've got some photographs of um, about the outside those um, those west doors in, in Lemster mm. with Fred Davis. Hadley wasn't on it. But uh, we were with them. Um, Captain Bengoff, he was the um, um, he was the chairman of the Hertfordshire Guild of Craftsmen, and he, he's on the on the photograph. Yeah, yeah. Well, maybe we'll pop back sometime and and take some. That's it. I'll I'll, I'll I'll find these photographs for you. Yes, thank you. And you, you. Can, what's the name of? Um, oh, I showed you the one with the horses at the yes. the thing. Yeah, yeah. Oh. Oh. Thank you for talking to us and we'll come back and talk to you again because I'm sure you've got lots more to tell us. I have. But thank you very much. That's all right. Uh, we're visiting George Mills. It's Jackie Markham and Trisha Carter um, talking to George on the 12th of October 2023 for the Kingsland Oral History Project. George, we saw you last week. You told us lots of your stories um, and I understand you've got a lot more to tell us. So please do share your memories. Yes, well, um, uh, next to the forge was a black and white cottage, now gone, um, where Mary Goodwin um, had a little shop. Um, I only think she sold um, uh, sugar and tea and coffee and a few things like that, uh, not in a big way. Um, and um, that was right by the blacksmith shop. And at the station, uh, Mrs. Evans... Um, sold cigarettes right by the side of the station there. And her husband, Tom, 
uh, worked on the railway and one of his duties was um, uh, looking after the uh, the way bridge at the station. Um, there was one son, Philip, who always went by Taffy, was a guard on the railway until the uh, it closed, and he w he was later uh, postman in, in Kingsland until he retired, and he was also uh, secretary of the uh, Kingsland Football Club. Yeah. Um, on lower down the village was um, uh, Victor Evans, who was the agricultural contractor, um, and his wife Mary, uh, uh, kinder people you'd never meet. Um, they came from New Radnor, um, and uh, Vic kept a lot of pigs and one thing and another, and also this contract in business. He was a he was a lovely chap. He was, um, and then. Not very far from the uh, blacksmith shop was Harrison and Barber's, the, the slaughterhouse people. Um, they were the London firm. Um, the um, there had been a slaughterhouse there years before, but I can't remember. It, it was Harrison and Barber's in my time, and but the, um, there had been one there years and years before. But I I can't recall the name. Can't recall the name. But um, I know Fred Davis said. Um, their Sunday morning sport was going to Broomiel catching rats. They were that thick. In the edge rows and one thing or another. Aye. Anyway, um, Harrison and Barbers, like I say, London London firm. <coughs> and there you've got about oh, six six or so lorry drivers and about four in the, in the people in the yard. And their lorry went to London five days a week. Um, they uh, changed with the empty lorry coming from London um, at the Windrush Cafe at Burford on the Cotswolds. And uh, the London driver brought the empty one down and took the Kingsland one back. And in the front end of the lorry was flesh. Um, and we made uh, fitted partitions in these lorries in aluminium because in the back they uh, they took live animals. They slaughtered animals in in London, um, horses and, and cattle, and they went into the human uh, food chain at that time. Oh. It wouldn't, wouldn't be allowed now, I don't think, like, you know, you, they wouldn't be allowed to carry that, that, that flesh in that lorry like that now. But they had a contract for London Zoo with, with, with their flesh, and um, I know uh, Jack Knight was the manager of Cockney, and he told me that um, uh, one of their com competitors or other people who did the same thing in London were Shapiro's, Shapiro's, of Helen Shapiro, the singer. Yeah. Walk on back to the happiness, isn't it, or something? <laughs> yep. Ah, it was, uh, it was up there and something as well, you know. But um, no, it was, a, it was a big firm and we, we did quite a, quite a lot of work, work for them, you know, in, in different things. Um, they had live horses. Uh, would come from right up, um, I can't remember the name of the, the people, but up in Cumbria somewhere they bought live horses from, cart horses and that. And I know another of them was Boons of Chester. They they dealt with them and that was another firm, firm that sold it on to them, you know. Yeah. And I expect, of course, um, you, um, like France is the place for, for horse flesh and that, but um, I think in London at that time probably you could, you could buy it, you know. But... Um, no, um, um, a, a very successful firm for, for, for a good many years, you know. George, was that at Broomy Hill, the, the slaughter yard? Was that at Broomy Hill? It, 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 Broomy Hill was yes. a slaughter yard, was it? Yeah. That's it, yes. No. Um, um, they'd got other depots down the south of England, and I can remember one of them was the home farm Pusey in Wiltshire. And I think there was another in, in Buckinghamshire. I'm not quite sure whether it was Ivor or not, but uh, they had. It was a, a, a big, um, a big firm, you know. Um, oh, um, when um, I went to Kingston to begin with, and uh, Davis is at the Angel Pub, 
uh, they kept a milking cow. And they got him in, I think, what is now we call the, the village green, I think. He was in front of the angel, the field in front of the angel. And when I was going to work in the, mor in the mornings, sometimes, on the Midland Red Bass, Ali would be out in the field milking the cow. He could the, the cow would stand while he milked him in the field, milked her in the field. Yeah. yeah. Um, they also did at that, about that time. The um, there was a lot of farm sales. Uh, farmers were retiring, and that after the war, and in the late forties, uh, early fifties, there was a lot of farm sales, and um, in the bigger ones. If uh, Russell Baldwin and Bright were doing them, they'd have a bar, and uh, the angel ra ran the bar, and uh, they, with all of them together, they could they could, could be done because um, Fred and and uh, Walter were in the sh village shop, and they also had the bakery there, so they were set up for the job, you know, um, and he had a trailer behind the car, Ali took, and they went to the the, the farm sales. And um, I know one of the things they did, they went to um, a sale at um, Sir David Arkwright at Kinsham Court um, for um, a reduction sale. Um, now the Arkwrights had been at um, Hampton Court here at the uh, foot of Dinmore Hill on the... Um, the um, Bodham side, uh, and they did thousands of acres and something at that time, and so it was. I would think they'd had stuff in storage for a good many years, and so they had a reduction or something there, of it, and the rest of it has been sold now recently, and it it was uh, sold up in Sotheby's or one of those big London auction houses, and they were talking about millions, the price. Some of those things they got were priceless, you know. Because they hadn't seen the light today for years, you know. They've been in the same family. Um, now they're talking about millions, and they were expecting a lot of it to go to America. But I never saw a report in the the local press about um, uh, what the, what the final outcome was, you know. Um, Sir David Arkwright was a, a very liked uh, person. He again, like um, Jeffrey Bright, um, uh, was um, uh, people were all the same to him. He treated everybody as equals, and um, they um, uh, the cook uh, at uh, First David Arkwright uh, pr pr provided the breakfast for the Preston postman every morning. She cooked a breakfast for the Preston postman every morning for years down there. And, of course, he was the son, I think, of uh, Sir John Arkwright, who wrote the poem, O Valiant Hearts, that is used in the um, uh, um, November um, Remembrance Sunday services. Uh, Sir, his father, yeah, mm -hmm. but no, a, a, a great, a great chap. Um, Ali Davis was not only a founder, member of the Lactonians rugby team, but he had also been very successful in a, a junior football team at Knighton, and Jim Miles, also from uh, Kingsland, played in the same team, and their goalkeeper. A uh, night and boy was called Ron Powell, and he later played professional for Chesterfield. Um, Ali, uh, like I say, not only on the, the that the rugby, but he ran it to White City, and he was only beaten by one of the top um, runners of the time, like Ibbotson or somebody like that. I can't remember which one, but it was one of the very top ones, and he also did a bit of. Um, uh, did a, a bit of boxing as well, but uh, he wasn't the only member of the the family. Um, be a sportsman. Uh, Fred, his uncle, had um, uh, played f uh, cricket and football 
uh, for the village and then he was um, a referee and he told me he used to put his bicycle in the guard's van on the train and he'd referee at places at Kington, Prestine, as far up as New Radnor, which was the end of the, the line anyway. And then he'd cycle back from there at night, and you know. And he knew every by road, I would think, in Herefordshire, Fred. Did he knew all the shortcuts? He was he was unbelievable, you know. Yeah. Um, yeah. Um, uh, Fred took me to Villa Park uh, to see Aston Villa play. Um, and it had always been my team. And um, he took me, we went through the the cemetery in Aston, right by the ground, and he showed me his brother's gravestone, uh, George Davis, who was the head farrier at um, uh, Answell's Brewery. Yeah, ah, wonderful. Um, and the other thing Fred used to say was he was, um, they were 12 boys in family. And he said, they all had a sister. And I said, not 24. And he said, no, 30. It was the same sister, he said. <laughs> uh, Fred had been a member of the Kingsland Fire Service. And he told me that they attended a fire at Neil Court Prestine in the 1940s uh, when a school that had been evacuated from... Um, London area, I think, and uh, the, it burnt down, or uh, most of it, I think, burnt down. He said it was uh, in an east wind and the water was freezing. As he was trying to put it on the fire, he said, he goes, oh, it was that cold. It's terrific, you know, and I don't think they saved much of it. Um, another thing he told me was that they had a practice um, with the fire engine at a well down the Mousenich Lane, one Sunday morning, and they pumped all morning and they didn't lower it, the well by an inch. And I could quite see when they put the uh, mains water into Kington, into um, Kingsland, um, they had a great trouble because the water level was only about two foot below the surface. Mm -hmm. And they had terrific uh, tr problems then. Uh, Fred made pig rings out of horseshoe nails. And he was also an expert on repairing uh, water pumps, the old cast iron water pumps. He had a supply of alder wood at the blacksmith shop in the forge that he kept dry. And he would make a bucket um, of this wood and he'd uh, nail leather onto it uh, with... Um, copper nails. He also, with the clack and that for the other part of the the, the, the pump, um, he would put it uh, um, in the, the dry earth in the, in the in the yard. He would sort of make a template and pour the um, lead in there to, to form it, you know. And, and he could do things like that. He was that clever. Um, and I know one of the pumps we repaired was at the burnt house at Cholstree. And the pump was on the opposite side of the road to the house on the Lempster Cholstree side. <coughs> and it was a deep, he was a deep one. He was uh, um, over 30 foot deep, that one was. But we, we repaired that one, yeah. Yeah. No, he, he was a, Fred was a great chap. He, he, he was wonderful. I, I, I would have backed him as a farrier, uh, nailing shoes on against anybody in, in the country. And we had a wonderful relationship um, over the years. It was, it was terrific. Um, he learnt me so much, but I never ever got anywhere near his standard. I never got anywhere near his standard. And if I'd have been doing it for another 50 years, I wouldn't have. No. Another thing Fred did was to help um, 
uh, the local undertaker, Jack Priest. And he was always being called upon as um, a bearer at funerals and that. Um, uh, the gypsies were still traveling uh, and with their horse drawn caravans in my early years at Cobb Nash. And uh, we'd spend, well, a lot of time shoeing for them, especially after hop picking, um, when they were going back home. Um, Fred, had, they'd been coming to Kingsland for years. And Fred knew um, knew all the families. He rattled their names off, and uh, some of them come as far as uh, North Wales. Um, uh, I knew the names of, of some of them, but not like he did, of course. Um, the most ones, the ones we saw most, was a Lock, Lock family. Um, the old people were Enoch and Violet. Um, Enoch, uh, Violet wasn't about too long. Of course, she died. Um, they had four sons um, and four daughters, I think. Um, their one daughter was deaf and dumb, and she died when she was about 16. Um, they also had a brother who was deaf and dumb, uh, but he stayed with, with the family. Um, The uh, one boy uh, was called Zaki, but he didn't stay with them long. I, he, I think he finished up in the um, uh, Bridge, Bridge North area. And uh, John, Johnny, his brother, told me years after that he had a serious accident when he was traveling in a car and something came off the back of a lorry or something and went through his windscreen and, 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 and nearly killed him. But I, I never saw him again. Um, in 1953, we shot three piebald, skewbald foals. The oldest w was seven weeks old, and the youngest was five weeks. We put very f uh, small steel, like racing plates, on them. Um, their feet were tender. As, and they couldn't, uh, and soft, you know, being young, and they'd get, going on the road, they were getting getting lame. And um, I, I know when it was, because um, Enoch gave his daughter, who um, he used to call Britty, or something at that time, or Brittle and Britty and something, but I found out in later years that her name was Lily. And he, he gave her one of these foals for her birthday. And she was the same age as me, so that's how I could I could remember it, you know. Um, we had uh, one of the I can't remember what what uh, gypsy people they were the name, but um, uh, they had um, the wood in their um, wheels were falling apart, and they brought their caravan and left in the yard, and we took the wheels off. I uh, two or more. I might have been the four. I can't remember. And we took him to Harold Goff, who was the uh, um, wheelwright and um, the, that carpenter on um, the um, on the corner at, in Kingsland. Um, he too was a First World War veteran, and he served his apprenticeship with um, Alexander and Duncan in, in Lemster. <coughs> a very good craftsman too he was, and he repaired the did the wood part and he we brought the wheels back down and we rebanded them put the metal back on them and put the wheels back on and they came and collected them but while they'd got their caravan in the yard fred said to me come with me he said he said go up in there and he sent me up into this caravan and he said if you can find any dirt or dust in there I'll give you a five pound note, he said. He said, people said they're dirty and all this sort of thing, these gypsies. He said, nothing of the sort. He said, they have got a smell about them, but he said, but it's only from the wood in their clothes from being round the, the fire. He said, if you can find any dust in there, I'll give you a fiver. It was spotless. It was spotless. Um, years later, um, 
one of the gypsies came uh, pleading with me uh, to go up the street um, to his, I believe, father-in-law, I think. I don't think it was his father. It was his father-in-law, I think. And he said, Lord Almighty, I wish you'd come, sir. He said, he's freezing alive up there, he is. And I said, he was in a caravan and he hadn't got a chimney in there. He'd got a stove, but he'd got no eating in there. And I said, he was an elderly man and he was living with his daughter. And uh, I had to go up and cut a hole in the roof uh, to put the stove. He got the stove, he got the pipe there and, and the stove, but he, he couldn't like the fire look because he couldn't get the smoke out look. And and so I did that. And um, uh, do you know what? They they were as clean as pins, both of them, and, and, and the caravan. It was wonderful. And they'd got wonderful manners. They'd got lovely manners. But uh, I never saw them again. They never passed, uh, never don't know what their name was or any more about it, you know? Oh. Um, years later, um, Percy Fudge rang me up and said, uh, could you come up? He said, the boys have had an accident. He said he'd been into the railings down the drive, which is a street, street court drive, not his. <coughs> Went down there and he made a mess, broken all these railings in two places. And uh, anyway, I found out then it was the gypsies. And they'd driven through there with their truck. And instead of going back out to the gate, he, he made another hole to get back out onto the lane, lane again. And I, I didn't know for 30 or 40 years after who it was, but Albert Taylor, who um, lives uh, in a uh, static caravan um, by the, going out of uh, Pembridge towards Erzland by the telephone exchange, he lives there, um, and it was his father, he told me, and he said he was drunk in this lorry. <coughs> Percy Pudd said, I'll pay for it, he said, and I don't suppose he ever charged him. He was that sort of bloke, Percy Pudd was. Uh, wonderful people like, you know, the Pudges. Uh, very good. Um, and I think they, were, uh, they had a lot of hops at that time, so they'd always got gypsies with them. But... Um, I think the at that time, uh, the street, uh, Pudge's hop yards was the most northerly in, in the country. Uh, I don't think they've got so many now. I talked to young Percy uh, several years ago and he said, no, they'd cut down a lot of them. But no, we did a lot of, not a lot of work. They were, they were very good, the, the, the Pudge family, very good. A lot of the Locks uh, family are buried at Evington, and um, I don't know of later years, but at one time uh, they always kept uh, uh, fresh, uh, uh, fresh flowers on there. Uh, they looked after them, their graves very well. Um, only a, a few months ago, uh, I had a knock on the door, and um, it was uh, two. Uh, these Romany gypsies, but I knew th knew them. I they'd been here buying scrap off me a year or two ago, and they were grandsons of a fellow called Tom Smith, the two uh, we used to shoe horses for. And only a week or so after, there was another one came, and I knew he could see who he what what he was, and um, I asked him what his name was, and he said it was Butler, and I said any connection with. Willie Butler, and he said, good God, that's my granddad, he said. <laughs> I wanted to buy an old car off me. Uh, Bill Mitten had a, I would think, a very rare, I'd never ever seen one, not before or since, a one-horse mower um, that he said he bought off Alexander and Duncan when they had a branch in Hereford, and I think he said it cost twelve pound. And um, his harness uh, was made by Sankis the Saddler in Kingsland. Uh, whether it was, I'm not sure. I think it was Arthur Sankis' father or his grandfather. But he'd got two 
uh, brass is on the face piece, on the bridle. And I'd say, Bill, after your time, I want them. And I said, all he'd do is smile. He never ever said, yes, you can have them or no, you can't. <laughs> but whether they went uh, to um, uh, Acton Scott, I don't know whether it is the, the mower and that went there. <laughs> I was told it did, but I don't know. It, it could have been stolen out of his shed or something, probably after. But <clears throat> um, it done very little work. The paint was still on her when I saw it, um, because he would only mow perhaps ten acres a year. He hadn't got only got a small farm, and and so in you know, a big farm would do as much mowing in a, in one year as what he did in twenty or thirty. You know. So it was in, in tip-top condition, it was. But um, uh, anyway, like Arthur, Arthur Sankey um, was the first fellow I knew in Kingsland. Um, he was a fireman on the railway. And when I was going to school, he was trying to date my sister. And so I, that's how I knew him, Arthur Sankey. Um, he too was a, a founder member of the old Lactonians uh, rugby team, I believe. Um, and uh, he went on from being uh, uh, a fireman to, um, uh, to be, of course, a, dr a driver. Uh, we did all sorts of things at the, the Blacksmith's for Forge. Um, we made the gates for the Coronation Hall in Kingsland. Um, I think they were cash strapped or something at the time, and they were made out of uh, recycled railings uh, from Barrington Hall, outside of Lemster. Um, cars and lorries and different things would run into them, uh, but they never ever repaired them. Uh, they put uh, wire fences up or something, and um, they went into the scrapyard in Lemster, and uh, we'd get them back from there uh, for an old chap called Harry Smith, who'd been co collecting the scrap from Cobnash for 50 years. And he'd bring his horse out um, to uh, Kingsland, and he'd take all our old horseshoes and all our old scrap, and if he got some what he thought was useful things in his yard, he'd bring it back for us. And we'd have an exchange sort of thing, you know. Ali would have an exchange with him. And uh, if there was cash involved, Ali always gave me and Fred a, a, a tip out of it, out of the scrap. Yeah, wonderful, wasn't it? Um, no, he, he was a wonderful character. And, and his um, uh, um, trolley uh, wagon on the back of his horse was the old uh, um, Kingston fire engine base. Ah, ah wonderful book. Hardy Smith, yep. Yeah. Are you said about when you met him? Interesting character when I went to Kingsland was a chap called George Woodin. Um, I don't know what age he was, um, late 70s probably, and he, he lived in a village in the village, down below the garage, and his house, uh, the door was a, a split one, like a stable door, and it didn't open across the road, it opened straight, looking straight down uh, Kingsland Village. <coughs> um, he spent a lot of time in the pub, and Albert Davis told me there wasn't a man in England who had more beer bought for him than George Woodin. <laughs> I, I said he could drink in Kingsland most nights and it never cost him anything because people had put uh, money behind behind the bar behind the bar for him. Um, he uh, went to Dr. Vaughan and complained about his arthritis or something and he'd been a, a, a good footballer in his time. Um, they said he could have played for Arsenal or somebody. But um, he went to Dr. Vaughan and he complained about his ass right or something. And Dr. Vaughan said, what you want wood in is a good game of football. <laughs> and I can't repeat what he said. <laughs> uh, uh, George told me once that 
he was in a, a mowing gang which was then uh, on size by hand and he said they came to start to mow the uh, uh, what he called Pope's Orchard where the <coughs> memorial hall is now and he said they mowed about enough to lie down on and he said then he went across to Auntie Polly's at the Bell which was the pub and the rest of the day was spent drinking. <laughs> Apparently, uh, in earlier years, uh, they always had a, a, a foal show at Kingsland uh, with the Shire horses. And um, apparently you could get a, um, a goose, an uh, autumn goose um, dinner uh, for half a crown at, uh, at, the, um, at the bell. Uh, Mrs. Nill uh, was at Waterloo Crossing, uh, who'd operated the trains, um, and her, she'd got two sons, um, and one of them, I, I think he might have been uh, uh, a school teacher or not, but uh, we made a, a weather vane with a Hereford bull for Mrs. Corbett the Ox House, and it was taken he done it out of a book and he split it all up in quarter inch squares and he drew this bull on the sh a sheet of metal and we cut it out and uh, painted it um, in the Hereford uh, brown, brown and white um, and it was a beauty, it was a beauty um, and Robert Nill, I think it was Robert that was his son who did all this uh, but we'd done the metal work and when Mrs. Corbett uh, divorced Colonel Corbett uh, she took her took it with her to Staunton Court in Gloucestershire. Wow. Yeah. Okay. Uh, the first set of shoes I nailed on uh, was for a cart horse uh, for um, John Willem of Cholstry the horse owned by um, Evans's um, father and, and son, uh, Charles Tree, and it was for, he was going to compete in a ploughing competition at Lemster Ploughing Match. I would think it, it, he'd be in his 70s then, and it, they'd only got one horse, so he must have borrowed one from somewhere else to make, make, up, make up the team. But that was the first set I ever nailed on. And he was a champion ploughman, uh, Mr. Gwilym, and his son, also John, a few years later, uh, was crowned world tractor ploughing champion um, in uh, in Holland or Germany or somewhere rather. Yeah. Uh, junior. Um, if we meet and he's in company. He always introduces me. He's George. He showed me a dad's last horse. <laughs> he showed me dad's last horse, he always says. <laughs> I, yeah. Um, one of the other well, things we did, this, 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 another thing at the, the Forge, we made a large um, a crane to go on the uh, sawmills timber lorry. Um, the driver was Jack Williams, and but Jack Williams was also the manager of Kingsland Sawmills. And uh, that this Jack Williams, his oldest son John, worked for Ali, uh, and he worked with us when we did a, an extension on a barn at Brookbridge Farm. Um, he then wasn't with us long. He got in the parachute regiment and um, then uh, never saw him again back then. And he unfortunately lost his life on one of the airports down London. I knew whether it was Stansted or somewhere. Uh, they were reef surfacing the runway and he stepped out in front of a lorry and got struck by another one. And his two uh, younger brothers were. Um, uh, drove the uh, for Victor Evans on the contracting. Uh, 
Uh, well, I worked at, uh, for Ali at Kingsland. I had a small part in uh, making the altar rail for Monkland Church, <laughs> uh, which was uh, a very good, lovely, uh, a lovely thing. Um, years later, I made the one for Kingsland Church, uh, but um, I was very disappointed. It's very poor and plain, but um, I had to make it to specifications uh, by the church commissioners or somebody. Uh, it, I had no, no say in it, you know. But <coughs> I was pleased to do the job because um, it was paid for by um, Mr. Mrs. Meredith and her daughter who were at uh, just uh, the little um, farm by the by the Cobnash blackberry shop. Um, and uh, when uh, her husband Bill Meredith died, um, they made it, it was in memory of him. And uh, he spent a lot of time with me um, at the blacksmith shop. Um, he did farming up in the A on Y area, uh, but in the young, his younger days, he was a blacksmith at uh, Farlow up on the Clee Hill. And so he was always interested in what I was doing and spent a lot of time with me. And I got to know him well and I was so pleased to be able to uh, to do it. But I was very disappointed. You know, I've always been disappointed with it. it it's a very poor, very, very poor, I think. They made a bad mistake about it. Very poor it was. But, um, no. Oh. Thank you, George, for um, sharing all your memories with us once again. I'm sure everyone will really enjoy listening to it as part of the Kingsland Oral History Programme. Um, so thank you very much from both Jackie and I. It's been a pleasure. Thank you.